we are recording. And so we're in the Gospel of Luke. This is part six um, from the Gospel of Luke. And um, we finished off the last time in chapter eight. And once again, remember that Luke presents things in a chronological uh, pattern, um, being that he was a very educated man. He was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. And he was writing the the gospel, in fact, to Theopolis, his friend, who was also um, a non-Jew, he was a Gentile. And he wanted to write to make sure that he reinforced and clearly spoke to Theopolis, who I'm sure inquired from him, you know, are these things accurate? Are these, did these things really happen? And so he put the account together of the Gospel of Luke, which talks about Jesus as our Savior, but really also the power and authority that's in Jesus and that common theme that he's talking about, the kingdom of heaven, which is the kingdom that Jesus is the king of. So as we start right into chapter 9, it says, Then Jesus called the twelve together. Remember, he chose, the last time we got together, we talked about he chose 12. Out of all of his disciples, he chose 12. And he called the 12 together, and he then gave them power and authority over all demons and power to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So many people think that our responsibility and our commission is to go and bang on people's doors and stop people in the street and tell people that they're sinners and preach the gospel of, hey, you need to repent, you need to, you know, you're a sinner, you're going to hell, say this prayer and you're going to heaven. That's not at all what Jesus was preaching. Jesus told his disciples to go out and proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He, power, he gave them power to cure diseases. Now, could he empower us with the same power? Absolutely, because the power was the power of God through the Holy Spirit. And he sent them out to proclaim that the, the gospel. And he says, take nothing for the journey. So right away, they're thinking, oh, wait a second now. We're going to be out there. We're going to be trekking along. What if I get hungry? Uh, what if my sandal blows out? Um, you know, there's all these different things that go through their mind. He told them no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no second tunic. So he basically said, just what's what you're wearing, go. But just that. And they're wondering, OK, well, we're just going to have to trust by faith that we'll listen to the master. And they did. So he said, whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that area. So they went to different areas. They were going before Jesus so that they could proclaim the kingdom before Jesus got there. And he said, just, you know, wherever you go that you enter, stay until you leave that area. If anyone does not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that town as a testimony against them. So they set out and they went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. So the 12 went out, they were sent, um, and all 12 of them, um, a lot of people forget that Judas Iscariot was part of that 12, who was sent out to preach the kingdom of God and was empowered to heal, going out from village to village to village. Well. Of course, the word spreads. They didn't have the internet, but they sure had uh, the gossip trail. And when Herod, the Tetrarch, heard about all that was happening, he was perplexed. For some were saying that John, John the Baptist, had risen from the dead. Others, that Elijah had appeared. Now, even though Herod was basically a heretic, uh, didn't live his life for God, he was a Jew, and he had scribes that were around him constantly filling him in on whatever the law was and, and to help him to rule his kingdom because he was the king of the Jews at the time, uh, King Herod. And yet not so much followed by the majority of the Jews, but still had that, that king status. 
being perplexed. He thought maybe, you know, John had risen from the dead. Maybe Elijah had appeared. And so he was familiar with Elijah. And he said still others said that a prophet of old had arisen. So he's wondering, okay, which prophet then is now here? He's thinking, I beheaded John. But who is this man I hear such things about? And he kept trying to see Jesus. Now, interestingly enough, he was so vexed by John the Baptist that he equated John the Baptist to Jesus, who was sending his disciples out, who were healing and performing miracles. And it said that John the Baptist performed no miracles. He just preached a powerful message that cut deeply in to Herod. And so he hears this other message going on, and he's wondering, what is this Jesus guy? What is he all about? Who is he? Where did he come from? Then the apostles who are out, and now they call those 12 disciples apostles, they returned and they reported to Jesus all that they had done. You know, they had a lot to talk about. Because they went from village to village to village, and some of them shook the dust off their sandals because people rejected them, but others healed. Others did powerful things. We know that because the word got back to Herod of what was going on and taking them away privately. So Jesus said, well, you 12 come with me. And he took them away privately, and he went through to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds... Hey, they, where, where'd he go? Where'd he go? They found out and they followed him. But Jesus didn't get upset. He went with knowing whatever the Father's will is. And he welcomed them and he spoke to them about the kingdom of God, which is what he told his 12 to do. He was now preaching his kingdom. And he healed those who needed healing. So he continued on that good news, that gospel that God wanted to do, the Father's, his will, that he had sent the 12 out to do, Jesus just continued doing that with the crowd, the same thing. And as the day neared its end, imagine now they're exhausted because they kept they just never stopped working. And the 12 came to Jesus and they said, hey, Jesus, Dismiss the crowds so they can go to the surrounding villages in the countryside for lodging and provisions. You know, they need to go find a hotel or something because, uh, you know, they can't hang out out here. And how are they going to eat? They need to provide for themselves. So send them away for we are in a desolate place here. But Jesus told them, you give them something to eat. <laughs> and they're thinking, what? <laughs> they just went to him saying, these people need to be sent away. Jesus, you know, go tell them to leave. And Jesus said, you give them something to eat. And he said, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. And unless we go and buy food for all these people, and there were about 5,000 men, what, what meant equivalent to about 20,000 people. And he told his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. Now, if you have about 5,000 people, that's a whole lot of groups with 50 in each group. And remember, 50 is a lot of people. If you've got 50 people sitting in a crowd, you only have five loaves of bread and two fish. It won't go very far, even in a crowd of 50. So they did this, and everyone was seated. And taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, Jesus spoke a blessing and he broke them. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people, the 20,000 people who are now sitting down in groups of 50. Well, they all ate and were satisfied, meaning, well, could I have some more? Well, that was good, but thank you. You know, I wish there was more. They ate and they were satisfied. And the disciples then picked up 12 full basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Well, one day as Jesus was praying in a private uh, area with his disciples, he questioned them. What do the crowds say that I am? So we know he's not with the crowd. He's just with his close disciples. 
And who do the crowds say that I am? Because he knows his disciples is out there and, you know, trying to help people, um, you know, directing people, telling people to sit down. And they're helping and they're in the crowd and they're listening to what the crowd has to say. So Jesus is inquiring. And what do they have to say? Who am I? And they replied, some say that you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah. And still others that a prophet of old has arisen. The same thing that Herod had caught wind of. And it was the same response that they got from the disciples. But what about you? Jesus now pushes away the crowd, pushes away all the other people, and just looks at his close disciples who are in a private place with him and said, what about you. Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. And Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things. He said, he must be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now, he just asked him in a private place, who am I? Peter retorts the Christ of God, which we know in other gospels says, you know, you've only learned this because of the power of God, because of the Holy Spirit, that this is not something that came to you in the flesh. And so now with that said, He's telling them, well, now that you know this, don't tell anyone. Now that you all know that I am the Christ, because the Son of Man has to suffer, be rejected, and needs to be killed. And on the third day, race of life. Then Jesus said to all of them, if anyone wants to come after me, and he was not just talking to them, but he was talking to everyone after them, including us concerning the kingdom of heaven. And he said, if anyone wants to come after me, then they must deny himself. So you must deny yourself, he said, and take up his cross daily and follow me. He didn't say, go to church on Sunday. He didn't say, you never it feels right. He said, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, Jesus clearly said, this is why I'm dying. And if you want to be my disciple, if you want to come after me, if you call yourself a true follower of me, is what Jesus is telling his apostles, his disciples that are right there with him, then you must do these things. And then he goes on to say, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Now, through the years, I heard many people say that cost is too great. I, I'm not ready to give my life away to the Lord. I have things in life I want to do. I have plans. I have visions. I have things I want to accomplish. It's my life. I'll choose when I want to give it away. And Jesus would say, you're exactly right. It's your own choice. For whoever wants to save his life in this world will lose it. But then he would say, whoever loses his life for my sake, in other words, walks away from the things in this world, they will save it, meaning their lives. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world? I mean, we hear like Elon Musk has got all his money. He's so wealthy. He's so powerful. He can do anything he wants to. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit his very self, meaning his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in his glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So anyone who rejects Jesus and publicly is ashamed, 
to let people know, hey, I follow Jesus, that person can expect that the Son of Man will be ashamed of them. And they will, he will be ashamed in front of the Father and in front of the holy angels. But I tell you truthfully, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Meaning that they were going to end up being born again and they would see heaven. Also meaning that they would witness Jesus die and become resurrected, which ushered in that very kingdom, the kingdom of God. Well, about eight days after Jesus had said these things, so a little over a week, he took with him Peter and John and James. These were the three amigos that he constantly would take with him uh, when he broke away, even from the his close disciples, he would take these three with him. And he went up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. This had to be an incredible sight for Peter, John, and James to see, that the appearance of his face actually changed. He was still the son of man here on earth. And his clothes became radiantly white. Suddenly, two men, Moses and Elijah began talking with Jesus. They appeared in glory and spoke about his departure. So here is three of the disciples witnessing Jesus transform and into a state of glory, joined by now Moses and Elijah, and they're talking about Jesus's departure from this world that he had just told his close disciples about. And it says that his departure that he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Well, meanwhile, Peter and his companions, they were overcome by sleep. If you can imagine that, I don't know if this is supernatural or whatnot, but they fell asleep. But when they awoke, they saw Jesus, and they saw him in his glory, and the two men standing with him, and they were quite overwhelmed. And as Jesus and Elijah were leaving, or Moses and Elijah were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let, let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. <laughs> he was just babbling. We spoke a little bit about that earlier. Um, people sometimes just babble, and it was just babbling. He said uh, he didn't know what he was saying. While Peter was still babbling or speaking, a cloud appeared and it enveloped them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came from the cloud saying, "This is my son, who I have chosen. Listen to him." And after the voice had spoken. Only Jesus was present with them. And the disciples kept this to themselves. And in those days, they did not tell anyone what they had seen. In another gospel account, Jesus clearly tells them, don't tell anyone anything about this until after my resurrection. And so we know that, that they didn't say anything. And the next day, when they came down from the mountain, so they spent the night there. Jesus met a large crowd. They were all looking for him. Where is he? Where is he? I don't know. Well, they well, he went off with a couple of people up on the mountain. Where? Where did he go? I can imagine all the, the talking that was going on. And suddenly, a man in the crowd, he cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit keeps seizing him, and he screams abruptly. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It keeps mauling him and rarely departs from him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they were unable. Jesus said, oh, you unbelieving and perverse generation. How long must I remain with you and put up with you? So here's a different Jesus. Is he seeing the lack of faith? He's seeing 
people crying out and he is starting to realize how long will I put up with you? He knows that something is going to happen. He says, bring your son here. And even while the boy was approaching, the demon slammed them to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit. He healed the boy and he gave him back to his father. And they were all astonished at the greatness of God. You know, they didn't give credit to Jesus. They were astonished at the greatness of God, knowing that it was God who was working through Jesus. And while everyone was marveling at all that Jesus was doing, he said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. Don't you think that he was grieving inside already? He's starting to talk about it. He's starting to reveal it to his disciples. And he can feel the pain. Remember, he's in a human body. And he says, let this sink into your ears that I am about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they didn't understand this statement. It was veiled from them so that they could not comprehend it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. Then an argument started among the disciples as to which one of them would be the greatest. Isn't it just the human factor that kicks in? When all of a sudden now all these things are happening, Jesus is feeling anguish. He's sharing it with his closest people. In Koinonia, he's spending time with them. And here now all of a sudden they're arguing with each other. Who's going to be the greatest? I think I am. Well, actually, I think it's him over there. Why do you think it's him? I can see them sitting arguing about who's going to be the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the thoughts of their hearts, remember, Jesus doesn't worry about what's in your mind. He doesn't worry about what you're saying. He sees right into your heart. There's no lie that can be hid from him. And he had a little child stand beside him. And he said to them, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me, meaning the Father. For whoever is the least among all of you is the greatest. So now he's got a teaching moment here. They're all sitting there thinking, maybe it's me, maybe it's, maybe it's him. But now Jesus says clearly, the one that's the least among you, which none of you are bragging about being the least. That's the one that will be the greatest. Master said, John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he doesn't accompany us. He's not part of our denomination. He's not. He doesn't go to our church. He's not with us. And Jesus said, do not stop him. For whoever is not against you, is for you. And he doesn't say, whoever is not against you is my follower. But he does say, whoever is not against you is for you. And there were many who, although they weren't following Jesus, were there in a way where they were for what Jesus was doing. They were supporting what he was doing. They were religious people who could easily support what Jesus was doing. But that doesn't mean that they were going to be against him. They were for him. And as the day of his ascension approached, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He knew where he was going, and he knew what was going to happen. He sent messengers on ahead who went into a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But the people... There, they, they refused to welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, they refused you. Do you want us to call down fire from heaven and consume them? I mean, once again, human thinking. And Jesus turned and he rebuked them. And he and his disciples went to another village. He was like, 
How much longer do I have to put up with you people? You think like humans think. Don't you listen to what I'm saying? The kingdom of God is at hand. I just sent you out. You just did all these miracles. And now you're wondering who's going to be the greatest. And now you think that you're so powerful that you've clogged down heaven from heaven fire to consume people just because they didn't do what you want them to do. So he rebuked them. And as they were walking along the road, someone said to Jesus, hey, you know, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied and said, Foxes have dens and birds. Well, they have the, the, the nest that they live in. But the son of man has no place to lay his head. Then he said to another man, follow me. He looked right at another person in the crowd and said, you, follow me. And the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Well, it was traditional in that day that you had to wait until your father died, then bury him before you could actually leave. It was his responsibility to make sure that his father was buried. Okay, so this is a human tradition. But Jesus told him, let the dead bury their own dead, meaning if you follow me, you'll have life. You, however, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me bid farewell to my family. And then Jesus declared, because he, he heard what was going on, people making excuses why they weren't ready to follow him. And Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And that should speak to us. Because now that we have our hand on the plow and we are part of the harvest and we are following Jesus, if we take our hand from the plow and turn around back into this world, we are no longer fit for the kingdom of God. Those were Jesus's words. It's a powerful message. It's, it's something that we need to embrace and it should inspire us to stay diligent, as Jesus said, that if you want to follow me, you must pick up your cross and walk after me every day. So with that, that takes us to chapter 10, which we'll get into the next time.